I have spent the last two months talking up the Saints. Whether it was on this show or on Twitter or on any of the podcasts that I've been lucky enough to be a guest on, I've taken every opportunity I could to reinforce how dangerous I think this team is. They've got an elite young corner in Marshawn Lattimore, an elite pass rushing talent in Cameron Jordan, and an elite running back tandem that tears opposing defenses apart week after week. Hell, I could mention the slam dunk first ballot Hall of Famer they have at quarterback too, but to be honest with how well the rest of the team has played, he's almost been an afterthought this season. The Saints are a really, really good team from top to bottom. But, having said all that, they're also in trouble. A lot of trouble, actually. Because as good as they are, they're also unlucky enough to have to face a hungry, pissed-off division rival this weekend that is playing with the most powerful motivational chip on the shoulder of them all. Payback. It's hard to beat someone three times in one season, especially when they know your team inside and out like the Panthers and Saints do, but it's even harder to win three times when that rival team is perfectly built to stop you. In New Orleans' case, arguably the biggest strength of their team this season has been their punishing and versatile run game, and in Carolina their biggest strength has undoubtedly been their suffocating defensive front. The Panthers' run defense dominated this year against almost everyone, conceding just 88 yards per game on the ground and only 7 rushing touchdowns all season, both of which ranked 3rd in the NFL. Meanwhile, the Saints were equally dominant on offense, rushing for an average of 129 yards per game and leading the league in rushing touchdowns at 23. This matchup is very much about strength versus strength, which is why I was extremely surprised to see how lopsided the numbers were when looking at the box score from their two regular season contests. New Orleans, at least statistically speaking, didn't just beat Carolina on the ground, they downright embarrassed them. The Saints put up 149 and then later 148 yards on the ground in their two meetings with the Panthers and scored four of the seven rushing touchdowns that Carolina gave up all season. Against every team that was not the Saints in 2017, the Panthers only conceded 3.7 yards per carry, good for fifth in the league. Against just New Orleans though, they gave up 5.4 yards per carry which would have been last in the NFL by a huge margin. The disparity between those numbers is so massive that I just had to investigate the tape to see what the hell happened. And as you might have expected, I came away this week with some pretty mixed conclusions. For starters, I do want to make it clear that the Saints did find a legitimate crack in the Panthers armor and exploited it multiple times with decent results but they also had a lot of breaks go their way in these games that I'm not sure they're going to be able to replicate the third time around. And let's just dive into that aforementioned crack in the armor first real quick here so I can explain what I'm talking about and then I'll move on to the big picture of this weekend's rematch. You'll remember from my previous breakdown of Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara several weeks ago that I said the Saints offensive line is built differently than most. They have a mix of blocking styles within that interior line that allows them to execute a variety of different kinds of runs depending on which running back is in the game. Their center Max Unger is about as pure of a zone center as you can find in the NFL, meaning he's a bit lighter, quicker, and better at zone blocking, while the usual starting guards, Andrus Pete and Larry Warford, are giant behemoths that are not nearly as nimble, but pack a whole lot of power when blocking for downhill gap run schemes. When the Saints designed their rushing game plan against the Panthers, it became clear very quickly to me that they designed it with those stylistic differences in mind. They knew that their guards were not quick enough to pull off a reach block against a defensive tackle that's already leveraged ahead of them on the front side of the play, so they just avoided putting them in a position where they had to do that altogether. Instead, they left all of the hard work on zone runs to Unger, who is quick enough to handle that kind of role. I'll use this run from the third quarter of the Week 13 game as an example. Before the motion from the tight end here, the Panthers were in what's called an under front, meaning the strength of the defensive line was on the weak side of the offensive formation. You know it's an under front if the three technique defensive tackle is lined up over the weak side offensive guard. After the motion, now the tight end has switched sides so the strong side of the offensive formation is now on the left instead of the right. That means that technically Carolina is now in an over front, not an under front. An over front is where the strength of the defensive line is on the strong side of the offensive formation. And again, you can tell which is which by where the three technique defensive tackle lines up. If he's on the strong side of the formation, it's an over front. This isn't just any three technique defensive tackle though, this is K1 short. He's one of the best three techniques in the NFL, and the Saints coaching staff knows that if this left guard, Senio Calamente, has to try to reach block him to cut him off from the front side of his own run, it's probably not going to go too well. So for most of the game, they just avoided running at him completely, regardless of whether it was an over front or an under front. And I say most of the game because they did try it a couple of times and it failed pretty miserably, which is of course why they only tried it a couple of times. The vast majority of their runs were aimed literally everywhere but where K1 Short was lined up, and for good 
good reason. But anyway, back to this run, in order to circumvent having to rely on their guards to win a matchup against Shore that they were probably not going to win in the first place, New Orleans instead focused on the one matchup on the line of scrimmage that they knew they could win, Max Unger against the one technique defensive tackle star Lotulale. Even though Lotulale was leveraged in front of Anger against any zone runs to his side, Unger is so quick and disciplined that the Saints thought he could take over that front side leverage with a reach block and win anyway. And if he could successfully reach block Lotulele on his own, that frees up the front side guard Larry Warford to both help widen out the defensive end as well as cleanly take on the Mike linebacker Luke Keekley on the second level. As the ball is snapped, you can see Unger take what is called a bucket step. Offensive line coaches that specialize in zone blocking always use the phrase, you have to lose ground to gain ground, and that's what the bucket step does. You step back about six inches at a 45 degree angle and quote unquote lose ground, but that six inches of extra space also helps you to widen out as quickly as possible and cross the face of the defensive lineman in front of you. In this case, that's Lotulele. And you can see here that by Unger's third step after the snap, he's technically lost two full yards of ground, but he's also now getting ahead of Lotulele on his front side shoulder, which is where you want to be on a zone run. He's starting to get into a spot where he can pivot around him and essentially box Lotulele out of the running lane. That's what zone blocking is all about. You're not trying to blow people off the ball, you're just trying to get in the way while the running back does the rest. It's all about angles and finesse, not necessarily power. As Kamara gets the ball, Unger is still leveraged slightly ahead of Lotulele, as he should be, while Warford advances to take on Keekley on the second level, and the right tackle, Ryan Ramchick, widens out the defensive end. This was not the greatest reach block in the world by Unger, but it was still just enough to slow down Lotulele and keep him from closing this running lane prematurely. And you know what? Truth be told, that's really all you can ask for out of your center on zone runs. Just get in the way, make sure the lane doesn't close early, and don't get flagged for holding. That's all you need when your running backs are this talented, just get in the way. Meanwhile, Kamara reads Keekly leveraging himself outside on the second level to hold the edge, again as he should be, so he cuts off of Warford's inside hip to get upfield instead. Thomas Davis is then just a hair late get into Kamara in pursuit, so he slips the tackle and scampers for a 17 yard gain. This run was executed just like how it was drawn up in the game plan, and the Saints attacked Carolina this way a lot. They knew that their best matchup was Unger on Lotulele, so they made no secret about running right at him over and over again while daring the Panthers linebackers to pick up the slack. And to be fair, most of the time, yes, those linebackers did pick up the slack because Luke Keekley is a freak of nature, but when you've got a running back tandem as dangerous as Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara, it only takes one mistake for them to punish you for a big play. New Orleans attacked Lotulele repeatedly and counted on those linebackers to eventually make a mistake while shouldering the load, and they did. A missed tackle here, a late read there, that's all it took. It's impossible to do your job as a linebacker when the defensive tackle in front of you is having a hard time doing his because it gives those linebackers zero margin for error and Sean Payton knew that. And again, that goes back to the Saints coaching staff being familiar with this Panthers team and what they bring to the table. They've played against this same personnel for years now. They know who the weak links are and how to attack them and get production where other teams could not. It was very simple to them, and if they continue to attack Lotulele this weekend and put all of the stress on Keekley and Thomas Davis to make up the difference, they might pop off a few big runs that other teams just don't get against this front seven. Familiarity is their greatest weapon by far. However, ironically enough, it's also kind of their greatest weakness because their entire game plan relied on the best linebackers in the NFL to make mistakes, which just doesn't happen that often. Carolina knew exactly what the Saints were trying to do. They knew that Unger was the key to their run game, they knew where the ball was going, and in week 13, for the most part, they were able to shut that game plan down because their linebackers were making very few mistakes. But then three critical snaps took place that changed the entire game. And I want to talk about these three carries because out of 148 total rushing yards for New Orleans in this game, those three runs accounted for 101 of them. That's almost 70% of their total rushing yards against a very good rush defense. And what's most important about that number, and maybe the most important narrative from that game itself, is that none of those yards should have counted. On those three runs, they weren't sprung loose because of any mental mistakes by the Panthers defensive front or any personnel deficiency, they were sprung loose because of frustratingly obvious holding penalties that were not called. One of them was a 20 yard touchdown and the other two accounted for 81 yards to set up yet another touchdown earlier in the game. All of that production and all of those points should have been called back. And I'm not talking about missed holding calls in the sense that there's slight holding on every play in the NFL, which of course there is, 
but these are some egregious holds that any referee crew should have flagged immediately. I mean literally defenders being dragged and tackled to the ground, shoulder pads being pulled from well outside of the blocker's frame, and nothing got called. I don't want to say that the Panthers got kind of robbed in week 13 because that would be a disservice to the Saints and how good they really are, but when I look at how dominant the Panthers run defense was against every other team and how much of the Saints rushing offense came on plays that should have been penalized, it makes me think the box score here might be just a bit misleading. Mark Ingram was averaging just one yard per carry outside of that 72 yarder that should have been called back on a hold against Lotulale. Alvin Kamara, without the two uncalled holds that sprung him loose, would have only rushed for 31 yards. And don't get me wrong, this is not me saying that the Saints run game was shut down on every play. I mean, they did execute very well in the red zone and earn two other hard fought touchdowns inside the five yard line. But you could argue that without some of those holds, the Saints would not have been given those red zone opportunities in the first place. So I suppose what I'm saying is this, don't completely rely on the box scores from those regular season matchups to form your opinion on the wildcard rematch. Yes, the Saints did exploit an advantage they had with Max Unger multiple times, but the Panthers also exploited their own advantage that they had just in having Luke Keekley on their team. Overall, it was a very even fight between two very good teams until the Saints started having a lot of things go their way. Things like those uncalled holding penalties that accounted for most of their offensive production, or Carolina special teams turnovers giving two short, easy drives to New Orleans that both produced points, or of course a key dropped interception in the third quarter by Daryl Worley that could have and should have been a pick. I'm not saying that the Saints got lucky, they're too good to get lucky, but they sure as hell had the football gods looking out for them on that day. It's hard to beat a good rival three times in one year, and even harder when that rival smells blood in the water. The Panthers know that the score doesn't tell the whole story from those regular season losses. They know how close they were to winning, and they know exactly what the Saints are going to try to do to them. New Orleans is a legitimate threat to every team in the NFC, I've said that many times before, but the absolute last team that they wanted to play against in the wildcard was Carolina. If anyone could pull off a road upset in the first round in the Dome, it's the Panthers. The NFC South is one of the most entertaining divisions in football because of rivalries like this one. Because of the fact that who is favored and who is the underdog really does not matter. It's always going to be a toss up. So after all of the praise that I heaped on New Orleans this season, after all the times I've called them the Dark Horse Super Bowl favorite, as weird as this is for me to say, do not be shocked if the Panthers take them down this weekend. It seems like every year we get at least one big upset early in the playoffs, and this season I think this one's going to be it. Do I think that ultimately the Panthers will make it to the Super Bowl and get another shot at being kings of the NFL? No, probably not. But for one weekend, this weekend, I think they can at least be kings of the NFC South. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode. We are of course sponsored again this week by our friends over at the BetDSI Sportsbook. And I'll tell you what, if you agree with my theory that the Panthers are going to pull off the upset this week in New Orleans, or even if you strongly disagree, BetDSI is giving you a chance to make a bunch of money off that opinion with an absolutely free $25 wager credit when you sign up with promo code FILM25. It is 100% no cost to you and any winnings you get with those wager credits are yours to keep. You can cash them out, you can use them to bankroll wagers throughout the rest of the playoffs, whatever you want to do with it is up to you. I just give you the code and you go win the money. So head on over to BetDSI.com, enter the promo code and go win some cash. As for me, I will of course be back next week with another film room breakdown on some divisional matchups. Obviously I don't know what I'm going to do yet because we don't know who is playing yet, but I've got some ideas that I've been hoping to do for a very long time, and ideally I can start taking those off the shelf next week. So that being said, until then, later. <laughs>